Okay. Um, firstly, I would like to welcome everyone to um, the BTEERI chapter for Zoom from lecture. Uh, we are uh, very, very happy and proud to be hosting um, Ms. Jamil Buffet today. Um, and without uh, further ado, I will hand over to Pat uh, to introduce uh, Ms. Buffet for her presentation. Thank you, Abdel. So, um, again, it's, it's our pleasure to have Mr. Neil Mafi with us um, today, providing this lecture for the Friedman Family Lecture. Um, Mr. Neil Mafi is the Chief Mitigation Officer at California Earthquake Authority, Sacramento, California. Um, Ms. Mafi, she received her MS degree in Civil uh, Structural Engineering and a degree in Architecture, both from the University of California at Berkeley. Ms. Maffei is licensed as both a civil engineer and structural engineer in California with over 40 years of experience in the design of new buildings, retrofit designs of existing buildings, seismic evaluations, seismic loss estimation studies, design of equipment anchorages, preparation of construction documents, project management, and construction administration. After 15 years as a project manager and regional office director with Delgun Co engineers, she opened her own practice where she managed complex design projects involving many disciplines. Um, in 2011, Ms. Maffei joined the California Earthquake Authority as its chief mitigation officer. In this capacity, she serves as the executive director of the California Residential Mitigation Program and manages the CEA research department. As executive director of the California Residential Retrofit Program, Ms. Maffei has been responsible for developing policies, plans, and incentives for retrofitting wood frame residential construction throughout California, intended to mitigate the consequences of a major earthquake in California. She also co-managed with the representatives from Federal Emergency Management Agency, which we all know as FEMA. The CEA slash FEMA funded Applied Technology Council Project 110, or the pre-standard for the seismic retrofit of single family wood frame dogs, now published as FEMA P1100. For CEA, she managed the 2014 South Napa Earthquake Single Family Dwelling Research Project and the CEA Peer Project, uh, titled as Quantifying the Performance of Retrofit of Cripple Walls and Seal Anchorage in Single Family Wood Frame Buildings, published in 2020. Her other professional leadership positions include Structural Engineers Association of Northern California, um, she, where she served as the board of directors uh, from 1995 to 1997. Uh, she was also the president from 19, sorry, 2019 to 2021. Um, she also was the president of the North, Northern California chapter of the ERI um, year 2010, 2011. And she also acted as the secretary and treasurer um, from 2012 to 2018. So Janelle, I pass it on to you. Thank you once again for being with us today. Thank you. And I'm so sorry we sent you such a long bio. <laughs> I apologize for that. <laughs> no, no. It's um, very important. Well, I appreciate that. And it's just an absolute pleasure to be with you all today. And I want to go right in, into this uh, presentation. <clears throat> Can you see my screen? No, can't see your screen yet. Okay, I think it's because I didn't click on it. Hang on a second. Okay. There. Perfect. You know, after two years, you would think we, we had this down as a, a science. All right. Okay. All good? All good. Great. Now, I won't be able to see anything in the chat. Um, I am happy to be interrupted with questions, or if you want to ask them in the chat, and if you want to read them out, or you want to wait till the end, Anything is fine. I'd, I'd love the dialogue of, of it. Um, but I, I, let me tell you a little bit about what, what I'm going to do today. <clears throat> I'll tell you about the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, or EERI. And the one thing I left off the, the bio, probably the most important, is I'm actually the president-elect of EERI. So I'm so thrilled that I will get the opportunity to serve as a president um, in, a, in a full year. Thank you to unmute. Congratulations. Uh, did you miss all of that? No, I'm sorry. That, that, was, that was my fault. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Um, 
it would not be unlike me to do, you know, half a presentation on mute. Um, mm -hmm. I think like, like all of us. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit about who EERI or who we are at EERI um, and what an or amazing organization. Then I'll tell you uh, a little bit about the California Earthquake Authority that I am now part of. Um, and then the earthquake risk and resilience world that I operate in. But, but with, in, within the context of kind of who I am and where I've come from and, and what it means to me, I, I, I have um, married, have two sons. They are grown now, both recently married and both have started families. Um, I'm 65, so I'm kind of like towards the, towards the end of a career. I, I call it my EERI presidency will be kind of a swan song. Um, but but it's an amazing opportunity at the end of my career to to go into this new industry and to bring my structural engineering uh, expertise and but learn a whole new uh, world of finance and insurance and um, of course more about seismology. So uh, it's been really exciting. So let me start with the ERI. That is why I'm here today as as an EERI um, visiting professional. It's an amazing organization that. Um, I have just made so many friends and so many colleagues and have met so many uh, brilliant peers established in 1948. It's been around for a long time, not nonprofit um, membership organization. And mo one of the most important things is the multi multidisciplinary nature. And I, I think in this audience, we have structural engineering, geotechnical, um, lots of different interests, I'm sure, amongst our, our audience today. Um, but each of us has a little piece of the puzzle and, and can bring part of the big picture. And the big picture is where it all happens, where all the magic happens is under that umbrella where we're, we're all working towards the same goals. And the mission statement is very important to reduce earthquake risk, not just to, you know, to do science, to, to teach, but to reduce earthquake risk, to really make a difference in the world by advancing science, advancing the practice of earthquake engineering, improving the understanding of the impacts of earthquakes and advocating advocating is so important for, um, I think we all know that, you know, the, the, the bright person who stays behind their desk and doesn't share that, of course, doesn't um, take the opportunity to, to, to really make the world better with what they know. Absolutely important to connect, to learn, to lead, to connect. Um, when I joined the CEA, I had, I had 30 years of uh, networking that I had done through, through EERI and people that I could, that I could call on to provide things to, to, to us as a consultant, to, to help share, to, to bring value, um, and to help me, of course, be a better employee for the CEA. Much of this um, from my interaction with, with EERI. How I got involved was I had joined Dayton Cold Engineers and Chris Poland, the, the president at the time had said, will you come down to Big Bear with me? Uh, he says, I know you know a lot about wood frame construction. I want you to help me look at it. There was just a, a lot of, of damage magnitude 6.5, uh, uh, kind of up in the hills above east of Los Angeles. Um, uh, a lot of, um, some permanent homes, but a lot of vacation homes. And so, you know, um, and, and a county and a city, which really changed how they, they you know, in, enforced permits, wonderful um, educational experience. But what I noticed is this hillside zipper effect where, you know, you could tell very, very much that the short, side of the of the crawl space under the house you know which has really you could say infinite stiffness or you know a lot of stiffness versus this flexible lower part of the house um, allowed it to move and the short little shear walls at the top would fail and then the next one would fail and the next one of course because they were stiffer and you would see this zipper effect and um, it was something that we were, were just starting to notice and um, we had an opportunity to write a paper and I was, I was absolutely hooked on EERI and, and what they provided. Members are geoscientists, engineers, architects, social scientists, public officials, emergency managers, and um, from all throughout the, the groups that are necessary to be under this umbrella to, to meet that EERI mission. They have amazing programs like the School Earthquake Safety Initiative. Um, very, very important. California has been um, taking care of our schools for, for decades. We're a little bit ahead in, in terms of that because of a 1934 earthquake, that 33 earthquake in Long Beach that created devastating damage. Um, but other states in, in uh, the United States are, are well behind with um, students in unreinforced masonry um, buildings. Um, so very, very important to... Um, <clears throat> Sorry, little things are popping up on my screen here. Um, to be involved in making schools safer throughout the United States. 
flagship Learning from Earthquakes program, this is where EERI really made its name, brought multidisciplinary teams together. It was really one of the first organizations that, that did this to go and to study um, from an earthquake, from all different aspects in that multidisciplinary perspective. Oh, and the most amazing thing that, that just happened a few years ago was a LFE travel study program, particularly for um, early career engineers and researchers uh, that, that sends them with these very seasoned people who have been out looking at earthquakes for decades to, to show them the important things that you do after an earthquake. Student membership benefits are really amazing. In addition to this program, there are competitions, the annual meetings, um, I don't know if this year is gonna be virtual, uh, are really an opportunity to, to network, to learn things, to really start to develop your, your community. And there are many things you can do right after graduation. There's a student leadership council, a young members committee. You can join the regional chapter in your area. Um, just a lot of different things for you to be part of EERI. So I, I really do recommend, and it's very, very inexpensive as a student and as a young a member to join. And it's really an opportunity to start to develop that network. Um, the regional chapters are here. Um, there are... Um, uh, throughout the United States, I think people forget that you know there there is in fact risk throughout the United States, and um, the student members get a first year of young professional membership free, and then reduced rates for four years. So I really encourage you, amazing people. EERI.org is where you can go to learn more about it. Um, so that's EERI. That's uh, why I'm here today. But why I am doing what I'm doing is because I was a consulting engineer. As I, as I mentioned, earthquakes became a, a really strong interest of mine very, very early on. Obviously, as a student at Cal, there's a, there's a tremendous focus on earthquakes. There's a tremendous focus in our practice because of course I did mostly structures in California. Um, but when you talk about resilience, you're talking about something really bigger than just the engineering. And um, the California Earthquake Authority's job flashed across my screen when I was sitting at home. My husband and I had been traveling a great deal. He was really kind of into semi-retirement. And I just thought, I'm not done yet. And this is what I want to do. And it's to bring earthquake resilient housing to Californians. Um, earthquake resilient housing and um, that resilient part and to all Californians was just so intriguing. Very quickly, my education and experience, <clears throat> some of that was in my bio, um, but when I put this together, I think it's important. I added the home stuff because it's really important when, you, when you're selecting a career, when you're deciding who you are and what you want to be. Um, you know, I was a, a female engineer when there weren't a lot uh, there, were, there were six females at, at Cal when I was in, in the graduate program. Very, very used to being just, you know, one female in, a, in an office, maybe two in a, in a, uh, a meeting, in, in a workshop. Um, I can remember going into the, uh, the C, or I think it's the EIT, and I thought I better go to the restroom so that, you know, well, there's no line at, at the EIT restroom on the women's side. Um, I kind of smiled uh, that I had forgotten that. Uh, but, but we call it work-life balance, but we really need to call it life because um, there is really, you know, there's no huge boundaries between all of that. And so I um, raised sons and um, to do so, you know, in the time that I was there, I had to do that by, by quitting my regular job where I was on the mommy track and starting my own business. So on one day, I was a, a member of Pharrell Assessor Engineers. And on a Monday, I was Janine LaFay Consulting Engineer. And it was a wonderful experience. To be a person who stamps and signs and makes all the decisions is really a, um, an enabling and a, a, a growing experience. Um, but then, of course, when they were, kids were back in school, I went to work for Dayton Kolb Engineers another stint as a consulting engineer, and then I ended up with the California Earthquake Authority. So a whole life worth of experience that I brought with me to this job, and I um, love this job. But one of the most interesting things is that I spent my entire career as a, um, you know, studying the physical sciences, uh, practicing. Uh, engineering is applied science, so applying the physical sciences, and, and then realized to be successful in this resilient res residential um, world in California, I was gonna be have, to, have to use a lot of social science and um, certainly had developed some of that and some of my uh, participation in these organizations as a leader and as a speaker certainly helped with that. But the idea was that human society and social relationships in that we can be as smart as we can possibly be in physics and chemistry and as astronomy and related subjects, but unless we're able to communicate, 
and to make those, those sciences and, and their, their repercussions relevant um, and to bring solutions to, to people. Um, we're really not uh, working at our, our optimal level. And so this is my little joke about how, you know, in engineering classes, there wasn't a lot of, uh, how does that make you feel? <laughs> there wasn't a lot of talk about it. You know, physical sciences are, you know, one plus one is, is two. Certainly when you get into some higher math, you kind of think that somebody's making that stuff up, but, um, you know, pretty practical, pretty pragmatic, the physical sciences, the social sciences are the touchy feely, the, you know, there's all kinds of words for it. Um, but, but let's just talk about it, the application of the physical sciences and, and in the real world and, and how it affects people and how it affects our world, you know, is, is what I had to, to learn. Um, so all these words, seismic, tectonic, acceleration, frequency, you go into a meeting, you're talking to a community, you're talking to a homeowner. There's a small group that might find it interesting. They might, you know, if they're listening to you, be Googling a, a word. Um, but for most of them, you know, it, it's not something that's really resonating to the decisions that they're making. The words that are resonating are financial security, safe, strong, resilient, um, consistent, ready, survive, prepared, family. You know, why am I doing this? I'm doing this to protect my family. I'm doing this to, um, to have the financial security to continue to protect them in the event of a damaging earthquake. And so you have to translate all of these physical science um, decisions and solutions and analyses into solutions and um, uh, recommendations using words that resonate to people. And so with that um, in mind, let me tell you a little bit about this organization that I joined in 2011. The California Earthquake Authority is unique. They are a not-for-profit residential earthquake insurer, <coughs> excuse me, created in 1996, but created because in 1984, the state of California passed a law that said that earthquake coverage is excluded from the homeowner's insurance policy. So it's excluded. However, at the same time, they said, if you are writing homeowner's insurance policies in California, you must offer earthquake insurance. They wanted to make sure that the, the insurance company wasn't always on the hook for that loss but they wanted it to be available to California homeowners. And so um, at the time modeling was at its infancy. You know, there were, there were some, you know, large computers. This is, you know, back in the day when you still were bringing cards into a building um, for somebody to run a, an analysis program for you. No laptop computers, no desktop computers. Analysis was at its infancy. Supercomputers weren't, you know, in offices all over the place. Um, and so insurance companies, based on what they understood about earthquake damage, uh, were selling policies and there was huge take up in California, you know, maybe close to 50 percent. <coughs> Excuse me. Along comes the Northridge earthquake. Twenty billion dollars in residential damage, so 40 billion overall. 20 billion in residential, half of that insured insurance companies lost their shirts. And with that mandatory offer law, um, <coughs> I'm sorry, I have my ear pads on. I can't mute when I cough. Uh, they lost their shirts. They were going to stop writing insurance policies in the state of California. Huge insurance catastrophe, mortgage catastrophe, because of course mortgages, uh, mortgage companies re require that you have earthquake, you have homeowner policies. Um, and just this huge, huge disaster for the state of California. So this, the state legislature stepped in and created the California Earthquake Authority as an instrumentality of the state, not as an agency. So it's this unique instrumentality that's publicly managed, governed by a board that includes the top three elected officials, the governor and the insurance commissioner and the state treasurer, two non-voting members representing the assembly and the Senate, but privately financed. So the companies in California that are selling homeowners policies join us as participating insurance companies. And they sell the, the insurance policy. They will adjust the claim after an event, but a check would come from the California Earthquake Authority. So unique, uh, not-for-profit provider of residential earthquake insurance. <coughs> privately financed also by the premiums that are brought to us by policyholders with a mission to educate, mitigate, and insure. So ed educate, people need to make 
inform decisions, um, particularly about the, the kinds of things that, that you know, insuring your house, perhaps mitigating your house. Mitigate, let's not only transfer risk through insurance, but let's reduce it through mitigation. And our core industry, of course, is insurance. Now you'll recognize um, the insurance companies on this slide. So um, most of the major carriers in California uh, joined as participating insurers in 1996 or have joined since then. <coughs> And I do apologize. I mentioned to um, my hosts earlier that I did have COVID in January of 2020, and I have um, unfortunately some long-term issues with a cough. Uh, it's important to note that um, an insurance company, when you uh, sell a policy to a homeowner, they bring all of their risk and one year's premium. And so um, we have now since 1996, over $6.2 billion in capital, but our, our, our risk, the, the, the losses that we have to be ready to pay are actually $19.8 billion worth. And that was in 2021. So we have to buy reinsurance, $9.5 billion worth of reinsurance, hugely expensive. <coughs> and we pass that cost of course along to the policyholders. Um, these capital reserves of 6.2 billion, the enabling legislation that created the CEA also created this loss mitigation fund that I manage, and that's what I use to manage the mitigation program. 5% of investment on this 6.2 billion every year, up to $5 million, comes to the loss mitigation fund for my group to use towards mitigation. And of course, this is meant for the policyholders. My program, our mitigation program, is intended for all Californians. So we have a, a $5 million uh, investment in that every year. <clears throat> now, I talked about education. One of the things that we're constantly battling are the myths. Um, I, I joked earlier about what I called the Dwayne Johnson earthquake, you know, the, the San Andreas movie. <clears throat> um, but there are some very basic myths, but they're pervasive. And one of them, unfortunately, is my residential policy will cover me for earthquakes. As I mentioned, there's a state law that separates it, and it's just heartbreaking after an earthquake to find that people didn't know that their policy does not cover earthquakes. The other one is this notion, after any disaster really, that the government will bail me out, that somehow FEMA was created to make us whole again after an earthquake, and that is not at all what FEMA was created, nor do they have the financial uh, structure to do so. Rather, they, they come in with um, urgent health and safety needs. And in particular, they were set up to, to do that for um, vulnerable communities. If in fact you have means, if you're paying a mortgage, if you, if you are um, you know, employed, um, your application for, for assistance would be given to this, the S, S, um, SBA, the Small Business Association for a, a low interest loan. And that has to be repaid. So these, these numbers that you get you know, in terms of a grant after an earthquake for vulnerable communities, I think in, in most uh, disasters comes out to be, you know, somewhere around $5,000. So, so the intent is they're not insurance. They're not intended. They may pass laws and come in with millions of dollars after an event, billions, <clears throat> but that takes years to get to, to trickle out into the community. It might be managed by FEMA, maybe by HUD. And of course, you're standing in line. So somebody who wants to be resilient, this is a very ineffective and very painful um, system. So for people, frankly, who can afford earthquake insurance, um, we do have some amazing products. There are competitors and we're and we an instrumentality of the state. We encourage people to, to shop around to find the best uh, deal that they can. <clears throat> you do find though, uh, particularly for the expensive houses in California, uh, that if you live near a fault, um, that uh, it can be quite e expensive. But we, you know, this is our core industry and um, <clears throat> certainly are, are trying very hard to get as many Californians insured as possible. Um, but let's, let's talk about risk for a minute because I'm gonna tell you about the mitigation program. So I wanna tell you about the, the components um, that we are looking at when we're looking at the earthquake risk to Californians. A risk is hazard plus vulnerability plus exposure. Um, sometimes people say hazard times vulnerability times exposure. Um, obviously, the <clears throat> uh, the uh, computer analysis behind a, a probabilistic study and all of this is going to be neither a plus sign or a multiplication sign, but it is th these three components. Uh, hazard, of course, where you are, what kind of soil you're on, what, what is the soil makeup between you and, and the fault rupture, vulnerability, what kind of a structure 
um, and you can correlate that very, very carefully with age because of course it, it correlates to the, the permit, uh, pardon me, the building um, <clears throat> code to which the building was designed. And then exposure. Um, one might say that, that New York City has the highest uh, earthquake risk, despite its very, very low probability of happening just because of the, you know, the dollars um, of real estate there. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, those are the, the three. Um, to the individual building owner, to the individual homeowner, though, this is a picture of their sole property, or perhaps they have a small portfolio. Maybe um, the mom and pop has, you know, a small apartment complex, three buildings, but exposure in most cases actually is quite small. So hazard, hazard, it's important to note, <clears throat> includes not just ground shaking, but surface faulting, ground shaking, landslide liquefaction, tectonic deformation, tsunamis, and, and satiates. So um, all of the, the pieces of um, what an earthquake can produce. <clears throat> I mentioned that location is important. Of course, location is, is essential. And when you're looking at California and you look at um, the, the tectonic plates around the world, the circumpacific seismic belt that's often referred to as the ring of fire is number one on the list in terms of um, the, the zones in, in the world that are the most um, seismically active. And of course that San Andreas fault that runs right up the coast of California is in fact the uh, separation between the Pacific and the North American plate. <clears throat> So obviously we're able to map now, as I said, mapping was an infancy in the eighties. There's been a tremendous amount of progress. We're able to map the, the risk and um, have done so for the whole United States. I think people are often um, surprised by the, the, you know, the brighter colors over certainly in the New Madrid uh, area, south of, of Illinois. <clears throat> uh, and then of course, out in the, the South Carolina area, um, the reality is, is that, um, that, that what would you call that quadrangle in the middle near Oklahoma City yeah, are man-made earthquakes. That is finally been mapped, the, um, the man-made earthquakes from the fracking that has happened in that area of the world, in uh, Northern Texas and in, in Oklahoma. So um, <clears throat> obviously Alaska, hugely um, seismic, um, very, very sparsely populated though, of course. So, you know, you can find some places, um, not without hazards, of course, they've got their, their own hazards, but earthquakes are, are um, found throughout um, the United States. When you're talking about the East Coast, a little different, that, that ring of fire doesn't run right up, you know, by, not bisect your state, but run right up the edge of, of your state, but rather it's out in the, the mid-Atlantic ridge, the, the, the tectonic, plate boundaries are, are out here and go right up through Iceland. Um, so there are mid plate earthquakes, the, you know, the two largest earthquakes in the continental United States were in that new Madrid zone, um, but obviously the probabilities are less. <clears throat> but there are interesting characteristics of East Coast earthquakes in that, um, and, and all of you who are in geology, um, you could step in maybe at the end and, and correct me if I say anything wrong, but it's older rock um, different, and, and rock that is, um, it, it, different characteristics. And so an earthquake that happens on the East Coast is felt uh, for significantly longer distance than those that um, happen on the West Coast. You know, there's the whole new Madrid earthquake ringing church bells in Boston. Uh, that earthquake that happened in Virginia, um, you know, that uh, was felt throughout the Eastern United States. And of course there were um, signs of damage, of course, throughout Washington, DC. <coughs> Um, talking about that mineral, Virginia earthquake, magnitude 5.8. Um, this is a, a, a shake map so showing um, uh, the perceived shaking from that earthquake. And of course, earthquakes really are local. You know, you, you find areas of high concentrations of, of strong shaking. And in this case, that's exactly what it was. And then of course, it, it attenuates, it dissipates as, as you go out. Um, I, I mentioned that there's a, um, that, Shaking can be categorized into these modified Mercalli intensity scales, the Roman numerals. Um, it starts as nobody perceives it to a few people perceive it all the way down to this 10, which is <clears throat> that even many buildings designed to be earthquake resistance will see moderate to severe damage. So that's that Dwayne Johnson earthquake. And then of course there's everything in between. <clears throat> Uh, there have been East Coast earthquakes of note. I mentioned South Carolina. 
Uh, this was the 1886 magnitude 7.3 in Charleston. Had the privilege of visiting that city and taking a tour. And uh, of course, there's lots of conversation about that earthquake on the tour. But you can see the, you know, the range of um, perceived shaking uh, was way out, you know, to Louisiana and um, above New York. <clears throat> Um, so significantly larger areas that that will uh, feel, but of course the you know the area that was strongly strongly hit, of course, was down near, near Charleston. There was a 1916 magnitude 5.2 in uh, northern Cal northern California, um, North Carolina, um, away from the coast though. Um, but you can see fives and, and to to sevens in terms of that modified Mercalli are in fact shaking intensities that were um, felt and, and could cause damage. And then of course, one of the problems is if it's not in an area that's perceived as having seismic risk, the buildings are not designed to that. And so that is one of the problems of the East Coast and certainly New Madrid, um, the prevalence of unreinforced masonry, like this picture shows, um, you know, codes that, that, that um, you know, have not kept up with, with the understanding of the seismic risk in the area, um, the reluctance to have statewide building codes, uh, the reluctance to um, incorporate seismic design in areas with with high consequence, but very low probability events, of course, um, have a huge impact. <clears throat> but if we move back to, um, to the West Coast, California is home to two thirds of our nation's earthquake risk. And most Californians live within 30 miles of an active fault. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with California, when you see this San Andreas fault, it's this bright red blaze that goes right down here. It's, it's rather inland down in uh, the San Diego, the, on the, the border with Mexico, and then goes off right below San Francisco and then re reconnects up here. Um, I think something like 85% of our population lives in that San Andreas Fault Zone. So it's not just the San Andreas Fault, but of course it's the, the faults either side of that um, major plate boundary that create this fault zone. And um, they have the capability of, of, of creating damaging earthquakes. <clears throat> so there's really a near certainty of a one or more magnitude 6.7 or greater earthquake striking California. 99% um, chance for those of us whose, whose purview is the state of California, just consider it earthquake country. So our, our, um, our um, purview, as I said, is, is predominantly along the coast in those areas of, of high seismic risk, which includes the majority of Californians. Um, where I live, there's a 76% chance of one or more magnitude seven or greater earthquakes uh, hitting Northern California. And then of course, there's that whole Richter scale um, logarithmic component, which is very confusing to, to people um, that the, the 7.0 is nearly three times stronger than the magnitude 6.9 Northridge earthquake. Um, so uh, I understand why the Richter scale was logarithmic, but um, that modified Mercalli intensity is really a better way of describing because it just drives me nuts to see in the newspaper that there was a four point magnitude 4.2 earthquake and no damage was recorded. And I'm thinking, oh my God, let's hope not. Um, because of course a 4.2 is so small compared to a, a five or a six. <clears throat> um, some of the other issues that we have translating this very complicated science is the notion that you know they'll show an epicenter on a map and an earthquake is, is really, an epicenter is where the fault rupture starts. But of course, the entire length of the fault rupture is really what defines what's going to happen during that earthquake. It defines the length. Um, it defines the, the amount of time um, that something will experience strong shaking. Of course, the, um, you know, the geography, uh, you know, when you look at the Northern California earthquake um, in 1906, San Francisco and, you know, areas were populated, but certainly not to the extent they are today, but not a lot of population up to the north of San Francisco. Of course, you take this earthquake and you put it right through um, the Los Angeles Basin. It's an entirely different earthquake. So, you know, I'll talk to people and they'll say epicenter and I'll say, well, it's your distance to the fault rupture. Um, so we're trying to come up with vocabulary with, with um, common terms. Visuals, of course, are, are, are very, very important in trying to convey these very diff different and uh, difficult um, uh, terms to, to people. This is that shake map, like I showed you earlier. And so the, the, the warm colors are the, um, the stronger shaking on that modified Mercalli intensity. You can see that basin effect, very, very important up here in Santa Rosa, which is just like an old, you know, prehistoric lake bed 
saw amplification, tremendous amount of damage. Um, you know, there was the uh, epicenter near San Francisco, there was northern and southern uh, fault rupture. And of course, um, you know, it attenuates um, out here in this kind of soup bowl of our, our central valley. They certainly saw some shaking, but out here in our, our uh, state capital of Sacramento, not a tremendous amount of shaking. But once again, 1906, um, fortunately, you know, the populations were, were actually very low. 1989, um, more recently, you know, lots of population, huge, huge increases in population during the world wars. Um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area because of the ports and the, and the uh, military. Um, but, but that earthquake, the epicenter was down quite far, 90 miles from San Francisco up in the mountains. <clears throat> and the, the rupture, not obviously for a, um, a smaller earthquake, not quite as big. So you can see that the warm colors really attenuated and, and dissipated. We certainly saw you know, larger shaking around the soft bay mud of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, but look at all the people that felt it. And this is one of the problems. When we're talking about social science, and we're talking about looking at the big picture. One of the problems we have is that, is that every person who felt it that day will tell you they went through the Loma Prieta earthquake. And of course, as a person who's trying to mitigate against the damages of a large damaging earthquake, what I want them to do is say, I felt it, but I know that wasn't the earthquake that's going to test my home, test my structure. Um, and, and that's hard, a hard step for people to take. And so, you think that sometimes these earthquakes are going to encourage um, mitigation, encourage behavior changes. And what they do is they embolden. And um, it, it, it's important that we, that we show them the, and, and are very clear about the fact that you put this earthquake in your backyard, it's a very different experience. And then also, you know, that the size of the earthquake. So here, for example, is the Loma Prieta earthquake to scale on the left versus this, the um, 1906 earthquake on the right. And look at the tremendous increase in real estate that was affected by that 1906 earthquake. And so all of these, these pieces that we understand and go into our probabilistic models are things that we need to, to find simple and, and um, easily understandable uh, uh, lessons for the, the public so that they, they don't go immediately to that very human um, natural response, which is I'm gonna be okay. You know, we do it all the time. I mean, we all, we all have seen that. Um, so I mentioned to you, you take that 1906 earthquake, you put it down in San Francisco, it, pardon me, in the Los Angeles area. Well, they did that. They did that as a scenario earthquake and they modeled the damage and it started down at the Salton Sea. This is LA County right here. And you could see it just ripped through all the way up uh, through LA County, um, billions of dollars worth of damage. And this is a, a scenario earthquake that people are using to plan and, and to make decisions down in Southern California. So these, these maps can be very useful. Um, but once again, all of this information, of course, needs to be very carefully and clearly explained to various groups of people that you're, you're hoping will take action against damaging earthquakes. So let me tell you what we're doing with our California Residential Mitigation Program. With all of, all of the background that I just gave you, California is earthquake country. Um, you know, we, we know that people have felt earthquakes. We know that, that there've been some damage. We know that, you know, there, there are no laws that, are, that are, have been passed. So we're looking for voluntary buy-in that, that they have the risk and that they need to do something about it, that they're gonna um, take the time, they're gonna spend the money, um, expend the, the energy on something and we're, we're trying to convince them. And so we, we, we talked about hazard and um, California's earthquake country, we're in areas of high hazard. Once again, we're fighting against that. Well, I went through the Loma Prieta earthquake. I, I always tell them, well, you went through the Kobe earthquake as well, but that's, it's about on a par in terms of the damage that you had. Um, but hazard, We've got those maps, you know, there is a realization in California that it's earthquake country. And now we have to say you individually live in a particular house that may have a seismic vulnerability. And so what we did is that we worked with uh, the Applied Technology Council to develop this document. It was like three years, uh, three or four years of work. FEMA was our co-sponsor. And we said, let's, let's take the top 
let's do some structural triage. Take the top four elements of, of residential construction in California, single family residential construction, and let's identify it. Let's figure out what you should do for it. Let's create plan sets that are pre-engineered when you can use them in design methodology. And let's have a, a cookbook that tells people what you should do about these and then develop simple visual cues for each of these vulnerabilities to help people identify them. And the first one was the cripple wall home. So let me, let me go back to that. That's the one on the left. So that's a house that has a crawl space. You know, there's a little door that you can go underneath and you can see short little wood studs that hold up that first floor. It's sitting typically on a concrete foundation. Living space over garage is you take out all the elements that resist seismic forces, which are walls on that first floor. You put spindly little columns next to that garage door and essentially you've created a soft story in a single family house. Hillside houses, uh, this was a, a house in which there was a fatality in the 1994 earthquake in Los Angeles. It was a pole supported house. They have no right to be built in California. Fortunately, there aren't many of them. Masonry chimneys are everywhere with the um, push to not burn wood anymore. You know, really they should just be taken down. If you wanna put in a metal insert with a, a light flue, that's fine, but they're the top four. So there's the, the four. This one, the, the cripple wall, we chose as our, our first incentive program because A, there's so many of them. B, they're easy to identify because we can use age as a proxy. And three, uh, we are also doing another project that, that showed us what the, the savings are when you do the retrofit. So let me start with um, age as a proxy. If you have a pre-1980 house, you might have this cripple wall issue. If you have a pre-1940 house, you will have this issue. The cost here is something that we did with Pier. Let's take a San Francisco magnitude 7.0 earthquake, this red um, bubble, I think we'll call it our pin. If you have a single family stucco house, best performing house, it's about $60,000 worth of savings. But that's for a $200 per square foot house that's that's a thousand square feet so you know you can multiply all these numbers by two to three for the san francisco bay area that two hundred dollars was selected as just kind of a um a benchmark but we're talking about you know one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the best performing house when you look at the worst performing house in san francisco under that 7.0 magnitude and it says 200 as i said we're multiplying that that by two to three because the, the, the replacement cost of houses in, in California are much more than 200. We're talking about, you know, four to $600,000 worth of savings for a retrofit that's about five to $6,000. So now I, I have something that I can tell you the cost benefit analysis is great. I can help you figure out if you have this house. And now I need to tell you what to do about it. Um, also, I need to be a little careful because we're kind of doing this on a vulnerability by vulnerability basis. And they're very clearly houses that have more than one vulnerability. They've got that cripple wall crawl space area. They've got that living space over garage and I need to combine them. And um, we're putting together a program to do that as well. Um, but this is the kind of damage that we see in these houses as well. And, and these pictures of course help quite a bit in, in explaining here's that cripple wall, that short little stud wall, you know, not properly anchored to the foundation. And there's no element, there's no, no finish on this that has any capacity to resist lateral or horizontal forces. It can sever gas lines, creating fire. It can block egress, of course, to a person with um, uh, mobility problems that can be deadly. Um, to people who are, uh, live in vulnerable communities or low income where they haven't been able to maintain their house, their houses are even more vulnerable. And what we did is we created the Earthquake Brace and Bolt Program. And um, I thought I had changed this uh, we are now at 16,000 houses in California retrofitted. We provide up to $3,000 toward that, that $5,000 retrofit. And um, we just got another FEMA grant so that we can keep this program going. We expect to be able to double the numbers. And in the process of doing this, we are uh, developing a, a vocabulary in California. When people buy a house, they'll go, is this been sheared or bolted? Or and they're starting to understand this is something that's important to do. And that simple visual cue of the pre-1940 house, you can see the vent holes around the bottom. There's an access hole, you know, um, it, access door, five or six steps up to that first floor. We can give them the tools they need where they could start to identify these vulnerabilities, very important. 
And this is what we do. So there's that crawl space before, and this is what we do. We go in and we anchor the foundation and we put plywood on those cripple walls. Five to $6,000 and um, saving hundreds of thousands of dollars in, da in damage. Now that living space over garage retrofit, a little bit more complicated. Um, I will tell you that the, the visual part of it is very simple. <laughs> uh, do you have a large garage door and is that garage door below any living area in your house? So it's pretty simple to see. I wanted to show you this. This is the, the, the those classic painted ladies in uh, San Francisco. And if you find a historic photo from 1906 um, with a city burning behind these, and you look and you kind of zero in, you'll notice there are no garages. Sorry about that. Um, Oh, go away. There it is. No. Nope. Um, there are no garages in 1906. These houses did better in 1906 than they would do now because they, they put in garages. They took out all of the, the, the walls on the first floor. They created these huge garage doors and um, they created a soft story problem. Um, so in 1920s, the advent of, of the car uh, was really a, a detriment to the seismic capabilities of houses in California. And we, we've seen damage. We have pictures like this from, this is the uh, 1989 earthquake. This is a sing, single family house. This one came down. You know, they just don't have the capacity either side of these garages. And so we have that, um, that document that we created with the, the plan sets, with the solution for this house. And the idea is how do we educate Californians to be able to, to use those simple visual cues? Okay, my house has this vulnerability and then to take that step. And so we are in fact provide, going to be providing a financial incentive, a grant for these kinds of houses as well. And then we're gonna get a little bit more complicated and, and combine the two grants when you have that composite house, the house that needs both of the retrofits. So it's a little bit like saying, you're not going into your doctor and they say, well, you've got, you know, you've got, um, you know, a little arthritis and you've got, um, you know, a little tendonitis and we're going to treat this one this way and treat this one that way. And you're, you're having to deal with these two issues it can get a little confusing. We try to use as little, you know, engineering ease um, language as, as we can and put it into words that they'll understand. Um, but once again, we have pictures from every earthquake of this kind of damage. And this is distressing because this problem can be seen in um, houses, up to houses constructed in 2000. Um, it, it's, a, it's an error in the building code and um, something that uh, we hope has been um, uh, mitigated. Um, it, is, it is difficult though when you see you know, a rather modern house that still has this vulnerability. And um, this is, as you can see here, this is red tag, uh, must be out of your house, dangerous damage where um, you're moving out of your house. We found after the Napa earthquake, those houses that I showed you that are cripple wall houses, people not yet able to get back in their home for two years, two years. So they have to move their family out, pay for a mortgage on that house that's damaged, pay for rent, find a place for their kids to go to school. You know, it, it, it's... It's so disruptive and so expensive. And for $5,000, I can, I can significantly increase the probability of you staying in that house. Now, mind you, for something that you may not see in your life, but if you do see it, um, will be this kind of, of, of um, absolutely um, disruptive damage to you and your family and your finances. Um, once again, the retrofit is very basic. Uh, if you have enough room, you can come in and put plywood on these, these walls. They have to be about five or six feet wide. And of course, they're usually not. So there are proprietary elements that are um, these steel, steel shear walls that can be inserted. And then, of course, you put plywood around the rest of the house. Uh, these cost about $1,000 each, these, these proprietary elements. Um, and you sometimes have to put in a foundation. So it's a more expensive retrofit. We're not exactly sure. Maybe in the $10,000, $15,000 range. Um, but once again, these can be a total loss of the property. So this is truly hundreds of thousands of dollars in damage that you are um, preventing with a very simple retrofit. And that cripple wall retrofit that I showed you can be done in two days. These are a little bit more intrusive, might take um, you know, a week or so, um, but really the, the, the time frame and when we put a grant into, into, the, um, into the, uh, the mix, um, you know, starts to become affordable to California homeowners. If you have a 
multifamily soft store, you might be putting in, you know, more of a steel frame or a very unusual condition where that um, proprietary element won't work. This is fortunately very unusual. And of course, um, once again, you know, these companies are making uh, these elements that um, are very easy to design and very easy to introduce. Now, when we rolled this program out, we were agnostic as to the um, financial situation of the homeowners. We selected the, the locations based on the um, high seismic risk, so right there by that San Andreas Fault, and by the number of pre-1940 houses in their community. And it grew, and we were really have great coverage along that San Andreas Fault zone in California. But we recognized that with just $3,000, we don't meet the needs of a lot of vulnerable communities, and particularly um, people who qualify as low income. And so all along, we have been hoping to roll out a low income uh, program, and we're so excited we were able to do it. Um, in the fall, we rolled out our supplementary grant program for low income home homeowners. And so what we did is um, this is a map that is showing all of the dots are retrofit in Los Angeles County. And we're going to roll it out in every every area that we're in. So we're in most areas in high hazard zones in California. We'll, we'll have this additional grant for low-income families. They'll have to, to provide some financial information to prove it. I think many of you may be surprised that $72,000 as a household income is what qualifies as low income. I mean, it's just outrageously, housing is so outrageously expensive. Um, and, and we're going to do a, a couple of things. It, so we zoom in a little closer and you can see our dots. You know, these bright red colors are really the high areas of higher um, numbers of low income people is we're going to do a couple things is we are going to increase our outreach in existing earthquake bracelet zip codes where we are. And then because this is just a little bit farther from the San Andreas fall or be, from a fault, we're going to take these areas of low income and we're going to add those zip codes. And um, so increase just our, our location will capture all of these low income areas. Now, the other issue that we have is that um, low income tends to have a higher pr uh, percentage of renters. And of course, renters don't make the decisions about where they live. Um, it, it's even difficult, if you wanted to include seismic in one of the categories, you know, you, you want a house that's uh, affordable, you want it in a good school district, you want it close to your job, seismic is gonna fall way foul uh, far down the list. So there's not even any consumer push towards making um, residences more resilient. Uh, and so the idea here is we are going to start to provide uh, incentives and have a very targeted market towards not the big companies that own thousands of houses, but people who own small numbers of houses. <coughs> I, I made it for a while there without coughing. I do apologize. I know I'm rupturing your ear eardrums. So going back, I am just so excited about this. This is new. Um, it, it's something of a pilot program. We're going to be able to do, you know, maybe a, you know, a couple hundred um, of these supplementary grants. The supplementary grant will add to that $3,000 and we will have, um, for the majority of these people, we'll be able to pay the full retrofit. And uh, really excited to be able to do this. And I, I hope in, in one of my future presentations, I'll be able to come back and say that it's been wildly successful. Um, but I've been waiting now for eight years to implement a low income program and um, very excited to introduce that. And then finally, we, we don't have unlimited funding. I can't retrofit every, every house in California this year. So we're, we're using FEMA funding. We take that 5 million. <coughs> <coughs> we leverage it with FEMA funds, grants. And um, you know, we're doing thousands of houses a year, but, but there are probably close to a million that we need to get to. So we decided we needed information for someone who can't get the grant. They're either, it's, you know, it's, the registration is not open, they're not in an area um, for whatever reason, but they need the information. And we created a very detailed website using our communications department, very carefully writing in plain English, All of the things that I've just explained, providing information with simple maps about your hazard, information with photographs, simple words about your vulnerability, and then information about solutions, what to do. 
<coughs> the big picture. Um, here's the problem that you have, but here's the good news. So we understand this problem. We've looked carefully at it. We have solutions for you. We've tested those solutions. We know that, that you're gonna be in a better place. We're helping you. Um, if you can, there are financial um, grants available, but if not, you know, these are that we give them some other financial, not advice, but you know, talk to your, your lender uh, with the idea that you're gonna strengthen your house, become more resilient. <coughs> and we dig, so there, there are three kinds of ways that people go to a site and learn. There's the waiters, they put their feet in, maybe touch the cold, eh, yeah, maybe I'll come back. And then there's the, um, um, the person that goes in maybe up to their waist. And so, you know, they, they're kind of get, getting used. And then there's the person that dives in and swims. And, and so you have to provide tiers for each of those. And each of them have a little bit of a, of a tease to try and get them to do the next step. Um, but as, as, um, with the help of the communications department, not engineering language, lots of pictures, lots of solutions, and lots of words that are describing um, where this will bring you and your family, what resilience is, what resilience looks like, so that you can make that very important decision. And here's um, one of my final slides is, uh, two houses that I found the day of the Napa earthquake. So this is a 6.0 earthquake happened at three o'clock in the morning. I got there at nine. This fence wasn't up. So this picture was taken a couple of days later. But this house, almost identical to this house, with the exception of the port, had come off its foundation. This house had a little bit of damage, you know, which is what you, you should expect. Owner comes walking out of the, the blue house. This one has got a you know, tape around it. Everybody's out of it. The guy in the blue house goes, yeah, I guess I was lucky. And I said, well, had you done any work in the crawl space? Had you done any retrofitting? And he didn't know what I meant, but he said, oh yeah, some plywood and some bolts. Yeah, we did some of that. And so he didn't even make the correlation between this behavior that he had, you know, that he had um, <clears throat> embodied and the very good place that it had put him in. But for the next two and a half years, as you watch this house unoccupied being constructed, tens of hundreds of thousands of dollars, going into the house next door, all the while not able to occupy, I think he, he got the message. And so here is the lesson. <coughs> Retrofit works. And this guy, did he have damage? Yes, he did. You can't prevent damage, but you can significantly reduce the likelihood that you're gonna have the kind of damage that puts you and your family out of your house. And that is what resiliency is. Resiliency is allowing you to be um, not maybe not whole, but 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 able to get back to whole and even to continue on that that um, trajectory uh, of improvement after an event. So with huge apologies for my cough, that is my presentation, and I would be absolutely divide, uh, delighted to um, thank you so much. Answer questions. Thank God, you I'm so sorry about the cough. Here, I'm going to do this. I'm going to put myself on mute. Thank you so much, Jamil, for the presentation. It was so good to see all your efforts in, in making our houses, particularly people who live in California, you know, making their houses resilient for, for earthquakes to come. Um, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Um, so if anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute yourself uh, or post a question in the chat, and we'll read it out loud. I was thinking, that was a lot. <laughs> um, I, I have a question to start with. Um, I was going to ask about uh, the planning of these. I guess we lost a dough. I was wondering if that was my computer. Or... <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez, I think you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. I mean, I'm sorry about your call. No, I, hope, I hope you get better soon it has been a long time but um this is this presentation was extremely interesting so uh, thank you very much um, my, my question is regarding what type of control do you have once you make these loans over whether these retrofits are done well and are because uh, this is uh, sometimes a lot of money that's been disembursed with the purpose of improving earthquake safety 
And how much control do you have of whether the professionals or the constructors that are doing this job are, are well qualified and the results are what you're expecting? Yeah, so we <clears throat> that's a huge, huge issue. And um, one that we dove into um, <clears throat> at, with, with, you know, at, at, and have pursued at great length. Um, because what we want is we want them to do a code compliant retrofit for the entire crawl space. That's not bringing their entire house up to code, but rather, you know, you're going to, you have three deficiencies. You're not anchored to the foundation. The, the cripple walls are not braced and the cripple walls are not attached to the floor. Three things. We want you to do all of that in there. So what we, we have the code that was adopted into the California building code. We require that they get a permit. And the permit must say it's in accordance with the code. <coughs> so we're utilizing the permit and the building department. And anyone who's ever done construction will go, well, that won't work. And I will tell you that, um, as I tell my kids, life is a spectrum. There are some out amazingly outstanding building departments. There's some building departments that would look me in the eye and go, we never crawl under the house. <clears throat> So we have a couple of other things in place. We don't want to be in the contract between the contractor and the homeowner for the very simple position that, that um, our program really cannot afford to take on the liability for all of this construction. It just would, it, you know, we would be dead in the water. But to get this money into the hands of people, we um, require that they get a contractor off of a directory on our website. The contractors must be licensed and bonded in the state of California. So there's a little bit of you know, them being licensed. That license can be taken away. And so I want you to think of leverage. There are laws, but ultimately what you're looking for is leverage. And a law can be a leverage. The $3,000 can be a leverage. So the homeowner wants to do it, right? Because the homeowner wants that $3,000. <clears> so the contractor has to take a, a, a training and a test that FEMA created and has to pass. So they go on our website. We say you must choose one of those contractors. You must get the permit. And then we have a, a third party inspector that goes out and tests um, a sampling of the houses. We have, oh, overwhelmingly, we've seen good construction. <coughs> it's, it's a very simple retrofit, but we have had some problems. We've had problems with contractors who did everything wrong. And so what we do is we notify the building department, the homeowner and the contractor with a letter and basically say to the, the homeowner to, and to the building department, you know, did you do your job? You know, if you approved it, that's fine. That's your purview. Um, and once again, the leverage for the contractor is if they misbehave, we can take them off of the directory and they significantly lose revenue. To the homeowner, we can refuse the $3,000. To the building department, if they misbehave, we go to the city council and say, we're going to pull the program out of your city because we, we've we gotten complaints that your inspectors are not inspecting. So we don't have a foolproof system, <clears throat> but we've put in as much levers as we possibly can over which we have control that don't insert us into a full liability um, relationship. Thank you. Just a quick question, Janil. Um, What's the turnaround time from start of application for a homeowner to the day it gets done with everything done? Yeah, so we, we do a 30 day registration period and then um, they all know that their application number is gonna go into an electronic hat and we pull numbers out of a hat. <coughs> we tell them to go ahead, then get a contractor and we give them, um, it's uh, eight weeks to get a contractor. And then they have, um, no, we're, we give them a certain amount of time to get a contractor and a permit. And I think that's eight weeks. And then a permit is good for six months. So we give them six months to do the work. So we give them plenty of time. The hardest thing a homeowner has to do is to get contractors to come out, look at your house and give you bids. And we strongly recommend they get more than one bid. So that's the hardest thing they have to do. And frankly, some of the contractors charge a couple hundred dollars. They'll refund that if you if you hire them. So it could be a whole year long process. But a person who's savvy, you know, and can get a contractor quickly, um, it's a two to three day construction job. So it's a matter of when that contractor can schedule you in is is really the impediment. 
Um, gotcha. And then we, we ask for photos to be up, uh, um, up all the photos and permits and everything are, are uploaded onto the website. And so people have a hard time. I, th I think we all, like humans will understand this. We have a, hot, a hard time dotting the I's and crossing the T's. And like sure. $3,000, you just gotta upload that one last document. Yeah, it's like your professor saying, <laughs> Just upload the paper. <laughs> right, right. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Anyone else has any question for Janil? I, I had a short question, another short question too. You mentioned three thousand um, dollar for a five thousand dollar retrofit. Is that five thousand a, a a cap for the amount of retrofit what you can do? Uh, no, so <clears throat> now that we've done over 16,000 retrofits, we have a lot of really great data. And um, the median retrofit cost in California is $5,500. The median in Southern California is closer to $4,500. And the median in Southern in Northern California, the Bay Area is closer to $6,500. Uh, cost of living labor in the Bay Area is significantly more. Um, the houses are a little bit more simple in terms of the retrofit in Southern California. So the geographic change differences are really interesting. Mm -hmm. We have an area out in San Bernardino that's really close to the San Bernardino Fault um, <clears throat> where the retrofits come in at about $4,000. And so that $3,000 goes a long way. And that tends to be a low income homeowner. So it's fantastic. So <clears throat> our approach and our, our outreach, and when we created the supplementary grant, we're looking at those individual characteristics because we're, we're trying to meet the, the actual cost of the retrofit. But it's interesting, when you, when you establish a grant, you establish the floor. Lo and behold, no one ever goes be below $3,000, right? Right, right. <laughs> the, the rare contractor does a $2,950 job. Um, and so people you say, you know, we've been open for eight years, we've never raised that cost. And um, because we knew that we had to settle in and let the contractors really start compete against each other. It was a very niche market where they were charging really whatever they wanted. And we're trying to establish a competitive market where homeowners will be better served. Um, and so um, it, you can imagine all the things that I've just talked about. I've talked about you know, construction and engineering. I've talked about um, the economy and low income and insurance and communications and it has been so expansive and and enriching to me to be part of this because there are consultants and people out there to help us with this um <clears throat> it's complimented but i'll tell you the first house we retrofitted in los angeles we went down to film and the owner turned to me and said i sleep better at night really and i thought <laughs> that's what it's about absolutely. that's what it's about absolutely Absolutely. Okay. I see that there is no other questions. No problem. There was a lot to that. I can understand. <laughs> um, but I, once again, I really thank you uh, for giving us that lecture, Janil, and you embodying the whole resilient attitude. I mean, going through that whole lecture with all its costs, we really appreciate your effort with it. Um, so once again, I want to give you a big thank you for doing this lecture with us. Well, I appreciate it. And my only regret, of course, is that we couldn't have been in person. It's, it's you know, to see your campus and to meet you all in person. So hopefully someday we'll, when we're all EERI members, I'll see you at a conference. Absolutely. I think that's a matter of time. <laughs> Not so much of it. Um, so yes. We will have our next session at 6.30 uh, using the same Zoom link. Okay. Um, so I think right now uh, people can go and take a break and then just join back in right in this room right again. Um, he, there's a message from Dr. Laura Nesser. Uh, I'm just going to read it out. This was a really interesting lecture. I teach intro earth science and always mention the Loma Prieta and Northridge earthquake. So great photos too. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate this. I won't be able to be here for the next uh, session, so I will say goodbye, but thank you. Well, thank you. And I just <clears throat> put my email in the chat. If anyone ha comes up with a question later um, or has any you know, questions about earthquakes or anything, 
uh, surrounding that business, I'd be more than delighted to answer. So thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we'll see you at 6.30. Great, thanks.